<laughs> oh, I love it. So today, so every month we pick a new topic. I pick a new topic for us to talk about. We started this a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, or yeah, school year, um, two school years ago. And um, we, I started with just what's hard about being human in 2023. And you guys gave me a list and we've been working down the list ever since. There was a long list of what's hard to be human, uh, about being human. So um, here we are in March of 2024. And one of the things that came up is like, why are we here? And why are all these horrible things happening? And like, is there a point to our life? Because it would be much easier to check out sometimes. Um, so the French have a phrase, the raison d'etre, which is translated the reason to be. And Japan has a phrase like this, ikigat, I think, I-K-I-G-A-T. Um, and both languages have this phrase that we don't have in English, but it's like, why, why do I exist? Why am I here? And we have that question a lot, um, but we don't have an answer for it. Uh, and as people of faith, I think we ask this question a lot. Um, so like an atheist would say, we exist because two people created a human being and cells divided and when you die, you die and that's all there is. But as people who believe in a God, a creator God, we tend to think or question, why, why were we created? Why did God put all of this into motion? Why, um, why do humans continue to be born when the world is such a troubled place? Um, so these are existential questions that a lot of us struggle with. And uh, so I thought today we would just explore some questions. And I hope that you will use this time this morning to just ponder. And then I would love for you to be able to kind of articulate, oh, this is the reason I exist. This is my reason to be. And we're going to, we'll go through it kind of systematically, but I'm hoping something will resonate um, with your brain today to just kind of get grounded in a sense of purpose that I exist for a reason and I am here for such a time as this. And I'm, I may not always have clarity on that, but I hope you can find a statement that feels true every day. So, Let's talk about, I would love for, well, let me go back a slide. Why do you think we exist? <laughs> why, why are we here? Um, why do you think humans continue to roam the planet? Why hasn't a, like a Big Bang or the, the extinction of dinosaurs, uh, that kind of science, why hasn't that happened again? When things get, are so ugly and we are reverberating so much and there are so many shakeups, why do you think humans continue to exist? Any thoughts? Yeah. I used to have a quote on my refrigerator by Auden that said, uh, we are here on earth to do good for others. What the others are here for, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That is awesome. We are here to do good for others. What the others are here to do, we don't know. <laughs> that is awesome. I love that. Perfect. Okay, so we are here to do good. What else? What does that mean to you, Judy? With emotions. Yeah, yeah, yes. I think we have the prefrontal cortex with primates. Um, no other species has that part of the brain. Only, uh, only monkeys, chimpanzees, apes share that with humans. And so I think that, you know, that would be the rational brain. That would be the logical brain. So we can learn, we can be trained. Um, so can other mammals can too. What we also share, so we have a three-part brain. There is the brain stem, the primal brain, the breathing, your automatic functions. There's the limbic system, the middle brain. That's, that's like a, a mouse. If you put a mouse in a maze with the cheese at the end, and then do it again, they're gonna get there, they're gonna go straight, right? It's learnable, we can learn things. That's also our emotional center. So mammals would have that. We know that with our dogs and our cats and um, we see that emotion with animals. 
but the prefrontal cortex is is only humans and primates. And that part of our brain continues to evolve. That's the newest part. Um, and so, yeah, that's interesting to think about why would only two species on the planet have logic and reasoning and decision making and planning abilities, forethought. Um, all other species operate on instinct. Um, we have instinct, but then we overthink it, <laughs> um, right? So that's a, that's a great point, Judy. Yeah, what else? Why do we exist? Well, I'm like super conditioned by the confessions being, you know, having also gone mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what is the purpose? What is the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And so I have that like in my mm -hmm. head. Um, also, I wanted to sing it, but won't do that here. <laughs> um, so I mean, I, but I do think that the reason God created was out of this overflow of love and we exist yep. for a relationship with God and there is a, like a base like in my soul that totally believes yeah. and holds to that and yeah. that is my anchor Yeah. and I can't always answer this question for my daily living yes and in, in exactly. a creative life where it, it's hard yeah and yeah. it's really knocking at my door right so I don't Exactly. I've got the church answer. I have the theological yes. answer. But yes. I don't know if I can marry that with a practical answer at this stage of my life. Yes. And I think that the God creating us for love is such an interesting point, Kate, because um, so if I think about, I was thinking about this driving here this morning, like, why did I have children? I Because ha I had infertility and we had to work really hard. And, um, and so I had children because I wanted to love them. Like I wanted my love to have a place to go, right? And that, and so when we couldn't have children, I needed my love to have a place to go. So we got a dog, <laughs> you know, but the love needed a place to go. And, um, and so then I thought, okay, maybe that's in my small thinking of God, you know, cause we personify God because that helps us understand God. But so God had a lot of love, as you said, overflowing. The love needed a place to go. God wanted to love us and enjoy us and created us. So like that kind of parent analogy helps us to understand why did we bring people into the world? Why did God bring people into the world? And as Kate beautifully said, this overflowing of love. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, any other thoughts? Oh, yes. Yeah. Leave it. Yeah. Yeah. Leave it better than like untouched and better than when you arrived or something. Right. It makes me think of that. Yes. That maybe we're hoping to improve things. I don't know. I think we're getting an F in that right now. Um, but but as you've heard me say, I have, hold on. Cause when people are like, where's the hope? Um, I talked to a mom's group on Saturday morning of young ones, like preschools. And they were like, I am losing hope for my children and their children. And, you know, and that like got, they were all like, yes, there's no hope. And I'm like, oh, geez, I got to give them hope. <laughs> um, and um, so I used that metaphor that you guys have heard me probably say of like the space shuttle reverberates the most right before the, it breaks through the sound barrier. And so I find hope right now in maybe this is the shakeup before the breakthrough. Also for like their children's grandchildren, I have to think that our brains will eventually evolve and adapt. We are living in a time where our technology has out outpaced our brain development. And so I think part of our overwhelm is that our brains aren't evolving as fast as technology and society is moving. So hopefully in a few more generations, I have to think maybe our brains will have adapted. Right, evolution, science, biology shows us that um, the fish that lives in the cave eventually doesn't have eyes because he never needs the eyes because it's dark. So biology will evolve. And I'm just thinking maybe we are just in this really reverberating time that our brains will adapt in future generations. Um, but it's a very good <laughs> question of are we moving forward or backwards? What are you here to experience? 
what are you, I hope, and I made these all like eyes, I think, um, so that you consider what am I here to experience? Because we would all answer this differently. Like existentially or here in this coffee and conversation? Oh. Uh, existentially. Okay. <laughs> the whole existential, the whole morning is going to be deep, yes. Okay. Um, so existentially, what am I here to experience? Although also we probably have a lot of good examples of what we're here to experience in this room right now. Connection, love, community. But we were talking earlier about like so many of us have experienced rock bottom tragedy and sadness and loss in this lifetime. Um, Am I here to experience that? Is there some, is there something about being fully human and running the gamut of all the things, the highs, the lows, the unimaginable, the, you know, the things we, yeah. What do you think? I think we are. Yeah. I think that's just part of, of experiencing life. Mm -hmm. and about it. Yeah. Yeah. See, see good in life again. Yeah, we've learned to move past and see good in life again. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it deepens. Yeah, it deepens our relationships to go through the darkness. I think it makes you more compassionate. It, yep makes us more compassionate. So maybe we are here to experience adversity by design because maybe that is a bonding that a, that a bonding growth that comes from it. So, you know, John of the Cross, one of the mystics, uh, Christian mystics, who's now a saint in the Catholic Church, um, he wrote of the dark night of the soul. He, that's where that phrase comes from, is John of the Cross in, in Spain in the 1100s, 1200s. And um, his writing on the dark night of the soul is that it's a gift. Um, you don't see it when you're in the dark night of the soul, but that it's actually a gift of getting closer to God. Because if we never had the dark night, if life's always easy peasy, then, you know, we just, we don't tap into God like we do in the dark night of the soul. And so his teaching is on the other side of it. You can look at it with gratitude that it equipped you and that it taught you compassion. It brought you closer to God. Yeah. What else? What are we here to experience? What are our kids, our grandkids here to experience? I think then one thing when you experience it, then Yes, exactly, exactly. Teach what you learn, yep, exactly, yeah, beautiful. What are we here to create? What are you here to create? Chaos. Chaos, <laughs> I love that answer. Chaos, that's awesome. Yeah, Brooke and I can hang with you. We're good at creating chaos. Yes, yes. <laughs> What'd you say? Nothing. She's embarrassed. She said nothing. Okay. She said nothing. Darn it, we missed it. Um, yes, to create chaos, though, uh, to create fun, to create laughter, to create memories. What, what are your answers? What are you here to create? I think about creating safety for others. Oh, good. Because life is really hard. Yep. And... I don't want to be around people that I have to pretend that it isn't. Yeah. And I love it when I say something and then someone else is like, oh my gosh, that is so hard. Listen to what my kid the other did the mm -hmm. other day or my spouse did the other day mm -hmm. or what happened to me at work. And to me, I mean, I, I live kind of in that world and I don't always like that because it feels like mm -hmm. very vulnerable and very like, like it's a liability. Yeah. But actually, I think that that is my strength. Yeah. Because it allows other people to be seen. Yes. And then that makes me feel alive. That's awesome. So creating the space and the safety for others. That's beautiful, Kate. I love that. Yes. That's better than chaos. That's it. <laughs> I love that we have, in one family, we have chaos and safety. Maybe mom created so much chaos that daughter creates safety. <laughs> okay, it's your brother. 
<laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Perfect. Family dynamics are awesome. Um, yeah, safety, art. Anyone here to create something beautiful? Mm. Brooke? Brooke's here to create beautiful I mean, things. Been that for us, just in terms of creating a, a space for. Yeah. If you guys see the before pictures of all of our classrooms and things like that, but it really has been. Yes. An artistic creation. Level. Yes. Create beautiful spaces. Lori, are you still working at a retail store? Yeah. What do you create for women in a retail store? There's there is an answer there. Don't say nothing. <laughs> don't say I don't know. <laughs> I know you're on the spot. I want a couple things from you. Yes. <laughs> Lori, we'll make a plug for In Clover and okay. Prey Village. <laughs> yes. Um, what do you create something? Well, I, I, um, I want to create confidence in women. Yes, exactly. Is, you know, I didn't know that was what I was going to be doing. Yes. <laughs> Confidence in women. Yes, you do create that. She's a support. Yes, you create support. <laughs> exactly. A lot, a lot of counseling that I didn't know I would <laughs> You create. But I love it. I mean, yes, you create a safe space to tell you their stories. And yeah, good. Yeah, Joe, what'd you create at Children's Mercy? Oh. <laughs> uh, mm hmm. Mm hmm exactly. Where people working there can achieve their goals. Yes. And do good work. Yes, exactly. Create culture. A lot of us do that in our homes, our organizations. Create a culture where people can thrive. A better way for our daughters. A better way for our daughters. Mm, that's what we're here to create. Whew. And, and, and sons to see those girls. And sons to see that. Exactly. Good men. We're creating good men. Mm hmm Yep. Yep. Yeah, what else are you here to create? Are you thinking of statements for yourself? I really want you to, to this morning. There's a lot of research showing, showing I quote some of it in, the, in my book, but um, that purpose, having a sense of purpose, really can be an antidote to depression, to anxiety. Um, to, you know, the, all the negative emotions that come with feeling lost or stuck. Often we get angry, we snap, we, you know, we're not our best selves. We partake in unhealthy substances um, when we feel lost. So all of that, having a sense of purpose can be an antidote for many things that, that harm us. Um, and there's some really good clinical research on people who can say, I'm here to be an instrument of love or I'm here to create a culture, or I'm here to help women be confident. If you can ha just have your little elevator speech statement, it's very good for mental health. Because we have these horrible days where everything, we just feel lost or we watch the news. And if, you don't, if you're not grounded in a sense of purpose of why do I exist? Why am I here? What is mine to do today? You can imagine how you just feel overwhelmed and give up. Yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, in that sometimes we, when we think of why we're created, we think we have to do something really, really exactly. big. And I just, the longer I live, I just realize it's in those tiny, tiny moments that nobody else may see. Yes. That those are the, the moments mm -hmm. that I think sometimes, you know, I feel like I'm here for those. Oh, it's beautiful. Kind of uh, small, small yes. moments. Yes. It's hard in, a, in our society because everything has to be big and, yes. you know, shiny, shiny and, yeah, and promoted. And mm -hmm. it's just, yes. it, I just think there's so much of the little stuff that's happening all around us yeah. that people are doing. And it is so important to value the little stuff, like making the ordinary extraordinary. Right, of that that should be more of a value than I made a big splash in the world. Yes. Yes. Doing great things with small things with great love. Yes, doing small things with great love. Mm. Mm. Perfect. 
Yeah. That could be your purpose statement. I do small things with great love. Mm-hmm. Mother Teresa would love that you're quoting her. Um, I have something yes. up in, our, in my house that says, it's a Mother Teresa quote that says, if you want to love the whole world, go home and love your family. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's good. That yes. <laughs> yep, exactly. Um, what are we here to learn? What are you here to learn in this lifetime or in this season of life? or this month, (laughs) right? Sometimes we have to narrow it down if your brain is overwhelmed. Um, What are you here to learn this month or this spring? What comes to mind? Let's inspire each other. Oh, it doesn't, that was too much pressure to say something inspiring. Um, Let's just share with one another. (laughs) Um, I just shut down all conversation right there. Um, what What are we here to learn this spring? What do you think? Yes. We come here. Yes. Once a month. Yes. So. Yes. We come here once a month to soak up each other and we learn so much from each other. I love that Brooke and Kenyon and Kate named this coffee and conversation because the conversation is the richness. Every time I leave here, these people are just ama- They continue to amaze me. So, yes, the conversation and learning something new. What else are we here to learn this spring? My dad has set a good example for me in that he's curious about almost everything. He's 87 and he still loves to learn. And so I'm trying to learn from him. That's perfect. Yes, curiosity. Yes, and constantly learning. I love that. Yes, and at 87, still learning. Beautiful. Yes. It makes me think like what what would a slowing down in this season where yes. things are reborn. Perfect. I'm here to learn to slow down this season and see and remember to be reborn, a reset. Yeah, beautiful. What else? Just learning to appreciate. Learning to appreciate. What we have, what we are able to do. Yes. Who we're with. Yes. Learning to appreciate. Good. Good. So your purpose statement could be something of, I'm just here, I'm here to learn. And if you woke up every morning, I'm just here to learn. Think about how grounded that purpose statement is, right? That's, that's enough. You don't have to go do anything. What if you're just a sponge? I'm just here to learn and soak it up. That could be a purpose statement. I really hope everyone kind of leaves with a sentence today. Um, We're just coming at it from different angles. Um, What are you here to teach? What are you here to teach? Everybody in this room is here to teach something. So if your brain just went to, ah, you don't have anything to teach. (laughs) Quiet that inner critic. We might have to review that this year again. Um, Quiet the inner critic because everyone is here to teach something. What are you here to teach? Earlier, Judy, I think you said what we've been through, you know, what we've survived, we can help somebody else survive. I think, like Brooke was saying, that tulips and the trees, I just like that sentence, just be still. Yes. And listen. Yes. Yes. Even learn. That's right. Be still. I am here to be still and listen. That's a good purpose statement. That's a great purpose statement. Yeah. So I'll speak for you too. Okay. But Barbara and I are both widows, and we have developed this widow group. Mm -hmm. And sadly, there are women that join our group. Mm -hmm. But I think part of our purpose is to teach that there is life. That's beautiful. And trying to give women hope. That's beautiful. Yes, yes. Wow. Yeah, because you're teaching. With the, um, the phrase, the wounded healer. Yeah, um, Henry Nowen. Yeah. Yes, Henry really Nowen. Awesome. And it's, it's scriptural. Yes. As well, of to be the one who is hurting. Yes. The one who is healed, and then the one who is helping. Yes. Henry Nowen, N O U U W E N. 
wait, did I spell that right? Mm -hmm. N-O-U-W, yeah. Um, uh, the Wounded Healer is the book, the title of his book. And yes, it is rooted in scripture. And he, it, that's a beautiful book, Brooke. I'm glad you thought of that. Um, yeah, that our adversity becomes how we help other people heal theirs. Yeah. We're here to be role models. Yep. Show care. Yep. And model it. Yeah. Model curiosity. Model love. Yeah. Yes. That. We're here to be role models for our grandchildren. Yes. Yes. What do you want to? Going with that. <laughs> what do you? What do you want to teach your grandchildren? What do you want to teach your grandchildren? Respect. Respect. Yep. Vulnerability. Yep. Yes. Um, yes. Their lives. And I think we're a calming force for them. Yes. And they can be, um, well, I'm not saying parents are judgmental, but we're not judgmental of our grandkids. Yeah. So they can yes. be whoever they They're want safe. to be around us. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Unconditional love. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think you teach and model unconditional love in a different way than anybody else because you truly do adore them and they could do no wrong. Whereas parents, it feels, love feels conditional to a child because we're trying to teach them things and there are consequences and, um, but you truly teach unconditional love. Well, and then there's also some benefit. I mean, when, when my mom comes to my house, mm -hmm. I cry all the time, part of the vulnerability. <laughs> you know, she just, my son will be grumpy and she'll say, oh, Becky. You know, and whereas I think, oh, back it. Right, you know? right. And uh, she just has this way of just letting things roll. It's no big deal, yep. Yeah. And just being a positive force. Yes. Uh, and not wound up tightly, just a, we're just here. Yes. And it's like, <laughs> yes. But I was not that way when I was a parent. Exactly. Yeah. I, I exactly. Just, yeah. <clears throat> That's I mean, right. I still am a parent. But. It's different. Yeah. Yeah. It's different. That's the, that's the thing. And like, as, so as mothers, we have to forgive ourselves for the intensity because that's just part of motherhood. And then we get to have the fun and the unconditional love in the grandparenting phase. You know? And so, because we all want a redo of less intensity. Right? I wish I could have a redo and know what I know now then, but I didn't know then what I know now. And that is just the truth of motherhood. Um, instead of, you know, creating more suffering for ourselves of shame or I snapped or I did this wrong or I messed this up or I gave them trauma or whatever our shame is, saying, you know what, that's part of being a mother and this is part of being a grandmother. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's like a reward. What'd you say, Lord? That's right. And you don't get there. You don't get there. That's right. That's right. You don't get the prize without the pain. That's right. Right. In in Buddhism, it's you don't get the lotus flower without the mud. Yep. Exactly, exactly. Lotus flowers only grow in the mud, um, which is such a great metaphor. Yeah, beautiful. Did everyone come up with something they are here to teach? Here yes. That I think that strong women are here. Yes. We are here, mm -hmm. and it matters. Yes. It's a yes. And we need to, I think we kind of talked about role modeling, but I, I think it's even beyond that. Yes. It was, it's interesting. My mom and I went to, my, Lauren was cheering at a basketball game last night. And so my mom went to see her cheer. And so just the two of us went and we, it was far away. We had car time, which is so precious um, in our busy lives. But we were talking about, I forget how we got on it, but Lauren, it, you know, to homecoming had all the girls had their dress, their cocktail dress and then tennis shoes. Yeah. And, you know, and my mom was like, I love that they're comfortable. And then we started talking. So we started talking about the generational changes. And so she said, I went to college in a skirt and heels. 
right? At Emporia State, we were not allowed to wear anything other than a skirt and heels. And then, and I was like, and then we still did those dances and those cheap, awful, you know, your feet were bloody by the end of the night, <laughs> heels. And then here's Lauren and her friends wearing their basketball shoes with their cocktail dresses because why would you dance in heels? That's no fun. You know, and it's just like, how watching this evolution just in fashion of like, why would women, and you know, and Lauren looks at me like, why would you put yourself through that? Like, that's ridiculous. And then we started talking about like, she wears things that my mom's generation would have been, you know, oh, a woman doesn't wear that because a man might think something of her, you know, and, and Lauren's like, you look at me, that's your problem, you know? And she has this phrase, clothing is not an invitation, um, right? And like, and so it's so interesting because their generation, all the girls in high school right now have this very different perspective um, from our generation and even one before. So look at how women are changing. Um, that gives me a lot of hope. We are evolving. Yes, we're evolving, exactly. Um, and so then I think in another two generations, what will women be like? Because we're there, so I don't think, you know, like we're getting there, but then I still played the game of trying to be a man in business, right? And I, I never could be a woman. I couldn't let them see me cry. I couldn't show a soft side. Um, and so then, you know, what's it gonna be like in a couple? I don't, I think we're gonna put these games aside that we've played as women. Yeah, yeah, I think we're getting it slowly. Um, are the men. Well, they read, don't like it. <laughs> I, well, I read something recently that Gen Z, the young adults now, are Gen Z men are like not into feminism. Mm -hmm. And they are like throwing back to these old expectations. Mm -hmm. and Interesting. I was <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But then, you know, the news latched on to how Jason Kelsey. Yes. <laughs> yes. Taught, yeah. him, taught a master yes. class yes. in how to be. Cry. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, emotionally intelligent. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. So we see the glimmers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of an NFL big dude with a beard. Exactly. I know the Kelsey's have been awesome for that. Mm -hmm. um, because to see those two men. Uh, be so emotional and so connected to their family and love their mama so much and and, and each other so much. I know. And I followed somebody that when um, DeMar Hamlin was hurt in the NFL game, um, they said never would the NFL have called off a game, you know, before. But we're seeing more compassion. And I thought, I took that as hope too. Like, okay, we're seeing some of the empire behavior soften a little bit. Maybe. Um, I think we have to hang on to that. I do think, though, in, you know, we're in a political season where there are certain people running that are very demeaning to women. And if, you know, depending on which voices are heard, it isn't, we're right on the line. Like we could go one way or another with men. And so I'm hoping the Kelsey's run for president. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm voting, I'm going to write them in. Let's all do that. How awesome would that be? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's an interesting thing to watch. Again, we're in the reverberation right now. We're in the shakeup. Which way is it going to go? Um, who am I here to serve? Who are you here to serve? What comes to mind? Anybody that comes my way. Wow, that's a beautiful purpose statement. I'm just here to serve anybody that comes my way. Think about, yeah. <laughs> Brooke's gonna knock. <laughs> it might be coffee. Coffee for Brooke. Yes. burgers and thought she sh should come home for, for burgers. She didn't want to come home for burgers. He said, what did you fix? Mm -hmm. And I said, we had egg salad. <laughs> she wanted that. Applesauce. Yeah. <laughs> But she wanted, she wanted something else. <gasps> yes, she wanted you. Exactly. It wasn't about the food. It was about being loved and soaking up you. That's awesome. Oh, I love that. 
That's beautiful. What else? Who else are you here to serve? What What could a purpose statement be with that? I wish the answer for me my whole life, and especially now, when you're helping me with this, would be um, myself. Yes. Because it never has been, and I bet that didn't occur to most people. Nope. <laughs> exactly. That's a great point, Laura. That's a really interesting thing that just occurred to me. Because I saw that question and I wanted to run out the door. Exactly. Because I feel like that's all I do is serve everyone except. Perfect. Ooh, I love that your brain went there today. Yeah. That is oh, awesome. I'm, I'm living right there. Yes. So you're in a season. And, yeah. and this is, there are seasons where we give and there are seasons where we have to restore mm-hmm. ourselves. And you're in a season where you need to serve yourself right now. Mm-hmm. And it serves other people. This is what, yes, this is what amazes me with the self-compassion research. There's over 20 years now at UT Austin, Harvard, Stanford, UC Berkeley. They all have centers just doing clinical research on the power of self-compassion. And that was a foreign language to me. I couldn't believe it. I think that's why I'm so compelled by the research. Um, Because I thought being super critical of myself was like my secret to success. Mm-hmm. and giving to everybody else. And I should be, you know, crawling on the floor because I served everyone so well, right? And that, that was noble. Mm-hmm. I should be beaten down and out of energy. That means I pleased them. Um, and I had that totally opposite because here's the, the piece of the research that convinced me that there's something to this is that I'm actually not the kind, compassionate person I want to be in the world when I'm completely depleted because I hate myself. Um, Hating myself makes me angry, actually, and snappy and unable to take criticism. And I'm actually not this loving person in the world. So that was like that got my attention and resonated with me. Like, oh, I thought I was kind to everybody else, but just really hard on myself. And it was like... Kristen Neff at UT Austin from afar called BS on me for that, you know? And I was like, wow, I really have to pay attention. If I want to be the compassionate person in the world that I say I want to be, I've got to do self-compassion. And then I was in seminary when I found that research. And so then Jesus's words, love others, comma, as you love yourself, finally made sense. I I always thought that was an egoic, as you love yourself. Well, I'm not supposed to love myself. So I'll just skip that part of the phrase of Jesus's teachings, right? But then I was like, oh, you have to have self-compassion and see your inherent worthiness before you can see the inherent worthiness and love for other people. If you don't know it for yourself, you you don't even know what you're talking about with love. Yeah, perfect, Laura. Yeah, story, yeah. Which is very debatable. Yes, I was going to say, how does it resonate with you? <clears throat> how does that story resonate, Judy? Well, I would have been the one fixing the meal. Yeah, Martha. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. But, um, that's... And what did Jesus say to Mary? Well, I Or to Martha? I mean, he thought Mary was doing the correct thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's how we interpret it. I've always kind of wondered, like, if we could read that story a lot of different ways. But if, so I've always said, but she couldn't have been enjoying herself with him. Right. If Martha was up. Exactly. It ta- yes, I wish Jesus would have said, you're both awesome. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> yes, yes, two things can be true. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think the editors cut out the rest of that story. Yes, if Joe. I'm thinking back to another session. Yes, you, yes. Um, when we were talking about serving yourself, mm-hmm. and the one challenge you gave to all of us mm-hmm. was in the next week to say no to somebody. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I've done that a little bit. <laughs> Good, Joe. <laughs> you know, so if somebody asks you, hey, do you want to go do something? You think, Right. I don't want to hurt them. Right. Uh, right. So yes. I'm more purposeful it's about me. <laughs> <laughs> Judy and Barbara don't like this so much. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, Joe. I love that. Yeah, I think we were talking about disappointing people and how uncomfortable we are disappointing people. And we all kind of like cringe when we have to disappoint somebody. And 
I am glad you brought that up because just because somebody doesn't like my answer doesn't mean it's the wrong answer, right? But I had always equated, oh, if you don't like it, then I said the wrong thing. Right, and so I'll deny all the things I need because I want you happy. Yeah, but then we're almost like manipulating our, exactly, and then we're resentful. Yes, that is not a recipe for sustainable happiness. <laughs> exactly. So, so we have to, pr- yes. Yeah, so the challenge was just practice because you get better at it if you just practice it. But quit apologizing for it. Yes, and quit apologizing. For, thank you for yes. waiting for me. Yes. And there's a, you know, exactly. uplifting yourself. Yes. And then sometimes you're just late and you have to apologize. Yes. But, I mean, right, yes. you know, but um, yes. I think I, I tend to apologize or feel guilty for when I, Take care of myself. Oh, yeah. 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 And guilt is, <laughs> I've, probably, I've said this, I know, but I have to, anytime I hear the word guilt, I have to, you know, you have to hear this seven times before it gets in your brain. Guilt is appropriate when I intended harm. I meant to hurt you. I feel guilty. That's appropriate. But we feel guilty for everything we do and we're not intending harm. We're actually trying to protect ourselves a little bit so that we're more compassionate to other people. Right? If, I, if I'm resentful of this relationship because I'm always giving to you, this relationship's not going to last. I am imploding this relationship in my overgiving. Like, you can think of the relationships in your life. If you overgive, you are actually giving that relationship a slow death because you're going to be resentful and then I, I avoid you or I don't return your messages or you think I'm mad at you because you're picking up on the resentment. So to save a relationship, you have to say no sometimes. Did you just say if you overgive, say that again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, if you overgive, it's a, slow death to the it's a slow death to the relationship because it's a recipe for resentment. So overgiving, so this is why, so I'm always looking for way, <laughs> write it down, next book. Um, <laughs> that wasn't in this one. Um, because I'm always looking for ways, because women feel so selfish that I'm always work, looking for ways to help our brains see it differently. So that is one. If you value this relationship, then you have to say no, because if you don't, You will implode that relationship because you're going to be resentful of all of the giving. So relationships have to be mutually beneficial to last. Um, I'm trying to think of the best author on this. John Gottman and his wife um, do a lot of relationship, marriage literature. There's also Shasta Nelson writes on friendship. She speaks to this. but they, they would all teach that a relationship has to be mutually beneficial. Now, there are seasons of give and take, right? Husband has a big job, so I keep everything running. But then at some point, husband retires and I get to play and you keep everything running. Or, you know, so there's natural balances. But if it is not mutually beneficial on the whole, that relationship will erode into a divide and split. Um, So if one of us is giving our everything into this relationship and we are not benefiting in any way, we are creating a recipe for that relationship to end because I'm going to get resentful and then I'm going to get snarky. And then you're going to say, why don't you like me anymore? You don't love me anymore. You used to love me. Now you don't. And then we're going to divide. So yes, I believe that to be true in my experience of watching people. So by saying no, you are gifting the sustaining of that relationship. You can just think through it later today of your relationships. Even, you know, organizations that take and take from you. Um, it, it were it holds. What about the benefit of saying no is one thing, but like you said, you could hurt the other person. Maybe they needed to see you and talk to you. Exactly. So maybe it's, I can't do it tonight, but can we make plans for next week? Perfect. To kind of temper it a little instead of, Perfect. No, I can't do it. That's exactly right. That's a compromise. Exactly. So Prentice Hall, who is a poet, uh, has this definition of boundaries that I just love, and that is 
the distance at which, or the line at which, I can love you and me at the same time. So you need me and I love you. I can't go tonight. I love me. But let's do it next week. So that is, I'm, I love you and I love me at the same time. Exactly. That's a perfect example. Thank you for that. Yep. How do you apply that imbalance in corrosive relationships when you're talking about like a parent-child yeah. relationship? I was thinking of my kids too. Yeah. <laughs> it's very hard. Except that I think it's, again, kind of seasonal. The first 18 years, <laughs> I pour into you. <laughs> I pour into you. <laughs> yeah. So 32 years, <laughs> 32 years, Laura, you are giving. But I also think there's mutual benefit. There, that's an important conversation, too. Like with a teenager, right? Now I can say, I, you're, you can't treat me like that and have me want to spend time with you. Right? So then that starts to enter the conversation of this has to be mutually beneficial. I'm not going to sign up to take you someplace if you're going to abuse me on the whole drive. Right? So then they start to learn, oh, I have to be okay to be with, or mom's not going to want to be with me anymore. So I do think you get a shift like in the teen years. But yes, motherhood, parenthood is giving. Right, what? It's any day now. <laughs> the shift is coming. I, I'm in the teenage stage, and I can promise you, you have more leverage. Um, you have cars they want and phones they want, and uh, you have a lot more leverage. Um, you have collateral to collect um, and hold. But, um, but yes, I do think there are seasons where I have to give. Or like if you have an, an ill spouse, this is a season where I'm pouring into you, right? But... I know at some point I'm going to have to pour back into me or I need you to pour back into me or maybe there is still mutual benefit even though I'm the caregiver, right? It's not that you still love me and I'm loving for you, I'm caring for you because you love me. That's the parent child thing too. But yeah. Also that's I think it's important for kids to see you caring for yourself. Yes. Um, Yes. Gonna, you know, we're going to take a little time. We're going to have exactly parent time on the deck. Yep. Because we have things we need to talk about. And exactly. You, you model that. Yeah. That's great, Anne. I mean, yep. Not all the time, but it's just there is a balance. That's right. Yeah. You're showing your kids and your grandkids how to be a human in this world, so they need to see every aspect of that. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Laura, you off to serve somebody. <laughs> 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 Serve yourself later today. That would be good. Deal? I'll try. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. I think, yes, this is the last one. So who are you here to be? Who are you here to be? An easy answer is the love in the room, myself, who God created, a child of God, a, an instrument of love, an instrument of peace. Um, what else? It changes over time. Yeah, T speak to that. Changes over time. Well, they're just stages of life. Yeah. What's expected or needed from you changes. Exactly. We evolve. We evolve. And our purpose needs to change, I think, too. Our purpose statement changes. Yeah, Judy? And I think back to having little children. Mm -hmm. always wishing, oh, I wish the two-year-olds were out mm -hmm. of diapers mm -hmm. five. I wish the five-year-olds were yes. able to do this. Always, you know, and I think sometimes we make the mistake of just not loving yeah. the period that you're in. So true. And, you know, I hated it mm -hmm. when all the teenagers I know. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. really good teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> you had really good teenagers. That's awesome. It's awesome. It's funny because I didn't look at your slides. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering. Yeah. And there's this, I feel this piece of me that I'm like, yeah, but we are so 
equipped to do all these things. Yes, exactly. But there's got to be something where you're like, okay, but where am I filling my cup? Where, especially you guys with the young kids. I, yep. mean, I remember feeling like just drowning yep. so often. So I think, yep. what is that? Yeah, you're here to serve all awesome questions. Mm -hmm. But to your point, mm -hmm. if nothing's mutually beneficial. Exactly. And you don't have something on the calendar for yourself. Yep. To pour back into yourself during these years. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's right. It's hard to not be resentful as a young parent because you're so freaking tired. Exactly. And you're serving, you're teaching, you're you're doing all these things. Yep. Every single day, constantly. Yep. So it's easy for us who are at different because I'm in Ginger's life stage. Yep. To say, you know, it gets oh, easier. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And be willing to get a sitter. Yes. To, you know, do the things that will at least give you like a little wind in your sails. And anything to get sleep, right? Like anything to get sleep because that's what complicates it all. That's why we're so intense is because we're running on a short fuse. Yeah. My husband and I made a deal when my oldest was a baby that no, we were not allowed to argue in the middle of the night because we needed our sleep so badly. If somebody exactly. said something, it yes. would get our adrenaline going and then we couldn't sleep. Exactly. So we just were like, Perfect. we like being married, so we, we're passing. Yep. You can be mad in the morning and yep. we never work. Exactly. We exactly. Yeah. I know somebody asked me like, you know, they they were arguing with their spouse about something and, and they were like, I know I shouldn't go to bed angry. And I'm like, I disagree with that. I actually think go to bed angry because fighting at night is not gonna go well. Yes, just go to bed, I know. And so like, let's sleep on it. And then we'll visit in the morning when we're sane. Um, because, yeah, so that adage, wherever that came from, be, you know, no, we're canceling that one. Um, sleep, go to bed angry and sleep, and then revisit it. Plus, you're not as, you're, it usually diffuses, right? Yes, it's gone, I don't care now, yeah. Exactly, that's, yes, yes. Yes, yeah, so the, I love the answers like Laura gave of, who am I here to serve me? It does not always have to be somebody else to any of this stuff. Teach, I'm here to teach myself to slow down. I'm here to create peace for myself. I'm here to serve me right now because I've served everybody else for so long. Those answers can all have more of an inner ring to them. What I would love for you to think about is what is my raison d'etre? Sorry, video watchers that are French speaking. Um, uh, but why? Why? What is my reason to be every day? What is my reason to be? And an easy one is the love in the room, right? Or just be love. My reason for being. So I use be the love in the room when I'm feeling inferior or not smart enough or, you know, I'm invited to something and I feel unworthy or I have that imposter syndrome, then I will tell myself, your job, Ginger, is just be love in the room. You don't have to be the smartest. You don't have to be the one that everyone loves. You just have to have an energy of love. That's all you have to do. And it takes off all that pressure to perform. Um, so that could be something for you. Be the peace in the room. Be the light in the room. What else? Good. Like being the voice for others. Be the voice for others in the room. Perfect. What else? Be the hope for, Be the hope for others. Yeah. The ability to give hope, love, light, that's a superpower. You have a superpower and you can, you can do that. We're all equipped for that. We all have that within us. Um, so, okay, in the time we have, what's your statement? What's your raison, raison d'etre? Do any French speakers help me out here? I think it's raison d'etre. Raison d'etre, that sounds beautiful, Kate. <laughs> raison d'etre. What is it? Michelle, what's yours? I'm, I'm just drawn to an instrument of love. Yeah, perfect. I think your words just resonate with me. Good. Um, I'm here to be an instrument of love. Yeah. Meg, what's yours? Um, be the light. Yeah. Yeah. I'm towards beginning that. You have that one. Good. <laughs> Anne, what's yours? Oh. I'm just popcorning here. Yeah. Good. I think that's where I am right now. Good. Lori? Um, I think what's been resonating with me is um, maybe 
bed is made for this day. Oh. To be open to that. I was made for this day. That's a good one. Yeah, Leah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Barbara. <laughs> I love that you were next, and you. I'll popcorn around, Barbara. <laughs> What's yours, Barbara? I'm going to be, you know, being the love and being the light. Being the love and the light. Mm. Beautiful. Awesome. Awesome. Good, Marilyn. What's yours? I'm here to learn and encourage others. Learn and encourage others. Deanne, do you have one? Um, what resonates? Ah, oh, I am evolving. That's cool. I like yeah. Kenyon, do you have one? Um, this doesn't sound like this is so generic, but my reason is to give. To be. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Kate, do you have one? Mine is hope. Hope. Because we all need something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Good. Good. Renee, do you have one? Be the love. Be the love. Ah, oh, we'll end on that one. Be the love. Beautiful. So go do it. <laughs> right? What is yours? Um, I think be love. Be love in the room. Just emit, radiate love. When all of you were little, there was a Marlo Thomas yes. record that was free to be you and me. Oh. It was so just, I haven't thought of that. Free to be you and me. Wow. Really cool. Will you run for president? <laughs> <laughs> Any of his options. All of you. <laughs> Let's do it by committee. How fun would that be? <laughs> you have international affairs and you have health care and you have we could figure this stuff out. Joe's in charge of health. You're the secretary of health care. <laughs> yes. Get a woman in the White House and we'll figure it out. Oh, uh, thank you guys so much. This is great. We'll be back in April, first week of April, 10 o'clock.